Very good. All right. So uh, last week in our teaching time, uh, we looked at the beginning of the kingship, uh, the beginning of the reign of King David. Uh, last week when we left off, um, David wasn't even king yet. Uh, Samuel came and uh, God sent him to the house of Jesse and he anointed uh, David as the next king. Uh, David went down in the valley and uh, killed Goliath. Uh, not the same story, but, uh, but uh, you know, if you were here. So, uh, but David has been um, anointed king. Uh, he is going to be the next king. But at this point in our story, uh, Saul is still the king uh, of Israel. And he's the rightful king. God um, had Samuel anoint him. He's been the king. He uh, was, was given that title by God. Uh, but, but God has rejected him as king because uh, of his sin and his rebellion. Um, but but David is going to take over after him. But uh, even though Saul is still king, even though he is still the man, uh, that doesn't stop him from um, coming into this point of hatred and jealousy uh, that he has for David. Uh, because here's the thing. The people loved David so much more than they loved Saul. They loved him so much more. Um, Saul was aware that Samuel had anointed the next king. Um, you know, David is this huge rock star, um, and he's thinking that David's going to make a play for the throne. Um, so he's, he's not okay with that. He hates um, David. And this is what it says, uh, page 151 uh, of the story. This is what it says. It says, when the men were returning home after David had killed the Philistine, uh, that would be Goliath, the women came out from all of the towns of Israel to meet King Saul with singing and dancing and joyful songs and timbers and lyres. And they danced and they sang, Saul has slain his thousands. And that's pretty good so far, you know. All these women came out and they're singing about Saul. Uh, but the next line says, and David his tens of thousands. He thought, or I mean, of his tens of thousands. Saul was very angry. This refrain displeased him greatly. They have credited David with tens of thousands, he thought, uh, but me only thousands. What more can he get but the kingdom? And from that time on, Saul kept a close eye on David. So the people loved them some David right now. They loved this guy. He was the man. He was the man. David was the man, and Saul was not. Saul was not the man anymore, and Saul hated it. He was angry, and from that point on, the Bible says that he watched uh, David. Because Saul knew David was going to be taken over, uh, over for king after he was dead. And, and it wasn't uncommon uh, for the next in line of the throne to take out the person on the throne to expedite their way to the throne. Uh, this was uh, this has happened since the beginning of time. Uh, you know, most of, you know, there's a lot of people that would do that, but David was not like most. In fact, David uh, had not one but two opportunities to kill Saul. Two opportunities to kill Saul. One time, Saul goes into a cave to use the bathroom, and that's the cave that David is hiding out in. And instead of killing him and, and getting away with it, uh, he cut off a piece of his robe. And then David felt guilty about cutting off the piece of that robe. Uh, so that just shows you who David was and who his character was. David was different, and, and that's why God chose him. But that doesn't stop Saul uh, from keeping an eye on David. His jealousy and his anger and his resentment uh, just grew and grew and grew towards David. Uh, and it turned into a lot more than just keeping an eye on him. It went from, act, from keeping an eye on him to actively trying to kill him. Saul, Saul spent the end of his reign not doing what was well for Israel, not doing what was well for God, not doing what was well even for himself. Saul spent the rest of his reign trying to kill David. His anger and jealousy and resentment was now controlling him. From the 18th chapter of 1 Samuel all the way to Saul's death in chapter 31 is nothing but one big cycle of Saul trying to kill David. Which, let's be honest, from a human standpoint, this is, this is kind of normal. This is perfectly normal. We see throughout history uh, people taking out their political rivals. We see it all the time. This is normal human behavior from Saul. This is normal human behavior. Uh, but that's the problem. That's the problem. Saul is using his human behavior. It's not an abnormal thing from, from the way of the world, from a lower story thing. Uh, but God is appointing David because David does things differently. He does things God's way. Saul's going after David. He's going to try to remove him from contention. Yeah, God has anointed David to be the next king. But David cannot become the next king if he is dead. So Saul's entire purpose in life now is to kill David. 
And in this time of David's life, in this time where he is fleeing from Saul over and over again, and he's being attacked by his men, uh, he's having to run from them, he's having to go to the Philistines uh, to hide himself. Um, these are where we get some of the greatest psalms that are found in the book of Psalms. These were prayers that David wrote down when he was leaning on God, uh, when times were going rough. And these, these are psalms that we can open up and we can look at when times aren't going well for us. And we can lean on these times. When we're broken, we're isolated, and we're down, we're needing to feel the close presence of God. That's how David was feeling when he was being chased by Saul. So he wrote all these down for us to use. But it wasn't all bad for David uh, during this time. Uh, along with God being on his side, uh, David also had a really, really good friend named Jonathan. And, and Jonathan, let's be honest, Jonathan was like one of the least likely friends in the world because Jonathan was Saul's son. And he was David's best friend. Jonathan is the son of the man who is actively trying to kill David, yet even though that, uh, David and Jonathan were close friends. First Samuel tells us that Jonathan loved David more than he even loved himself. And even in the presence of his father, he took off his princely robe and put it on David, symbolizing that he was giving him his place in the house. Jonathan loved David, and David loved Jonathan. Jonathan became a secret a double agent inside the palace. Uh, if Saul was going to plan something, uh, that, that Jonathan was going to be there to warn David. And on one event, Saul was so angered and he was ready to kill David. And it, was, it was just a matter of time before he killed David. And Jonathan warned him and saved his life by sending him off into the wilderness. He was a friend, a loyal friend, a great friend. Even though he was the son of the man trying to kill him, he took great care of David. He was a great, great friend that David had. But David had more than, than just Jonathan, uh, Saul's son. David also married Michal, uh, who was Saul's daughter. So now, and so David's best friend is Jonathan, Saul's son, and now his wife uh, is Saul's daughter. And at the time of the marriage, it says that she deeply loved David and looked at him with awe and respect. So when Saul gives his daughter to David, he does so hoping that she will become a snare and that he'll be able to uh, entice David to come so he can kill him. But instead, this turns into a good marriage where, where McCall loves him um, and, and respects him. This obviously made Saul hate David even <clears throat> more. And when we look at this hatred um, for David in, within the heart of Saul, we can see one driving force, and that's jealousy. Saul was jealous of David. Saul was so jealous of David and it controlled everything that he did. Saul was jealous of the fame that David had. Saul was jealous at the fact that God had chosen him to replace him. Saul was jealous at the fact that his own son, his flesh and blood, uh, the should-be next king of Israel, was a great close friend to David. He was jealous of the fact that his daughter loved David. This young man was ruining his life. Saul was jealous over everything that David was, over everything that David was, and he was jealous because that David was everything that he wasn't. When Goliath was coming out against the armies, it was David that rushed down and killed Goliath, not Saul. Saul was sitting in his tent. It was David that the people cheered for when Saul brought his armies back from that battle. It was David that Jonathan and Micaiah loved uh, and resented their father because of it. It was David. It was David that had the hand of God on him instead of Saul. It was David who was going to be the next king, and it was him that was being rejected as king. You see, David was the golden boy now, and Saul was the red-headed stepchild, and he hated David because of it. He was jealous of David, and he wanted to kill him. His jealousy drove him, and we can understand that. As human beings, we can understand this emotion that Saul is giving us. We can look at Saul's life and, and how he's looking at David, and we can understand exactly where he is coming from. Jealousy can make us do some crazy stuff. It turns us on our teammates, on our coworkers, on our classmates, on our loved ones, and even our spouses. There's a man by the name of Samuel Beckett. Uh, he was an Irish novelist and playwright. And he received great recognition and fame uh, because of his work. But not everyone enjoyed his accomplishments. Beckett's marriage was, uh, a score, was soured by his wife's jealousy of his growing fame and success. One day in 1969, his wife Suzanne answered, for, answered the phone, listened for a moment, spoke briefly, and then hung up. She turned to Beckett with a stricken look and said, what a catastrophe. 
Was it a devastating personal tragedy that had happened? Had a loved one died? No, she had just learned that he was awarded the Nobel Prize for Literature. She was jealous of her husband and couldn't even rejoice in the fact that he had won this award, this most prestigious award, a lifelong dream of any writer. And instead of being happy for her husband and cheering for her husband and, 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 and enjoying that moment with him, she is seething with anger and animosity. That's what jealousy does in the heart of him. That's what jealousy looks like. And jealousy is so much more than just being envious. You know, envy is a bad emotion in and of itself, but, it, but jealousy is so much worse. Envy is just wanting something that someone else has. If your neighbor comes home with a brand new car and it's a great car, you would say, man, that's a nice car. I like that car. That's being envious. But jealousy takes it so much further. Jealousy is not only wanting what the other person has, but it's wanting them not to have it. It would be your neighbor coming in with a brand new car and you say, man, I like that car. That's a nice car. I really wish he didn't have that car and I hope a tree limb falls on it tonight. And instead you stand and look out the window every time it storms hoping that a tree falls on his car. And every time he comes home from work, you sit and watch hoping that he comes in with his bumper dragging the ground because he got into a wreck. That's what jealousy looks like. It's not that you want this new car. It's a cool car. You wish you had that for yourself, but you don't want them to have that enjoyment. But we have all been in this situation. We have all been in a situation where we have actively cheered against someone that we know and even love because we are jealous of them. <clears throat> because they have something better than we do. Jealousy has its roots in pride. We want to be the best. We want to have the best. And if someone has something better than us or someone is better than us at something or they're higher than us in anything, then we want them to come down. We want to knock the ladder out from under them so we can get up higher. And as Christians, we should not be that way at all. As followers of Christ, we should not be consumed in jealousy in any way, shape, or form. Any emotion that drives us to actively root against someone in life is something that is pure evil. Jealousy runs against everything that Jesus and the early apostles taught. Christianity is built and based on loving God and loving others as yourself. You cannot love others as yourself if you are constantly consumed with jealousy. You cannot love others if you are constantly rooting against them, hoping they will fail so you yourself will look better. You wouldn't root against yourself. You wouldn't hope that something bad would happen to you. You wouldn't sit and watch the window hoping that a tree would fall on your brand new car. Love God and love others as yourself. You cannot love someone if you're jealous of them. And the reverse is also true. You cannot be jealous of someone if you truly love them the way you're supposed to. Jealousy has no room in our lives whatsoever. This is a place and an area of our lives where we must look differently from the world. Paul says in Romans 12 that we should rejoice with those that rejoice. You can't rejoice with someone who is rejoicing if you're jealous of them. If someone gets a great promotion at work, instead of, instead of you, see, instead of being sad or jealous, thinking that you should have got that promotion, we should rejoice and celebrate with them. If someone buys a brand new house that's better than yours, you shouldn't be jealous, wishing that that was your house, but you should celebrate that with them. If someone gets a huge win in life, something that you've been wanting for yourself, whatever it could be, instead of being jealous, we must rejoice with them and celebrate that win in life. Jealousy has no place here. And like I said before, it's all about love. Love one another. Love others as yourself. Outdo one another in showing honor. Jealousy has no place in the church. So if you're someone that is consumed with jealousy, um, you know, just you know, all the time or even on occasion, take that to God. Take that to God and give that to him and let him take that away from you and have him fill you with the love for others that you have to have. <laughs> So that when people see us, when people see you, when people see me, they see God's love. But Saul's jealousy, man, it ruined his life. It ruined his, his reign as king. Saul's jealousy ruined everything for him. So when we look back on the life of Saul, we look back on the, on the, the kingly reign of Saul, this is all we really see. 
And it didn't have to be that way. It didn't have to be that way for Saul. He could have been a great king. He could have been a righteous king. He could have been a king that even after his failure, even after he had gone wrong, even after God rejected him, he could have still went out with dignity and respect and humility. And he could have lovingly handed his kingdom over to David with honor and respect. But instead, he spent the end of his reign uh, drowning in jealousy and drowning in anger and drowning in spite. And Saul's life and reign ended where it should have been, battling the Philistines. This is from page 155. It says the fighting grew fierce around Saul, and when the archers overtook him, they wounded him critically. Saul said to his armor bearer, draw your sword and run me through, or these uncircumcised fellows will come and run me through and abuse me. But his armor bearer was terrified and would not do it. So Saul took out his own sword and fell on it. When the armor bearer saw that Saul was dead, he too fell on his sword and died with him. So Saul and his three sons and his armor bearer and all his men died together that same day. So in battle, Saul's life was ended. But not only Saul's life, not only Saul's life. He wasn't the only one to die that day. It says his three sons too, one of which being Jonathan. Jonathan was also killed in this battle. So in one day, Saul and his son Jonathan killed him. One day, David lost his best friend and the man who had been trying to kill him all these years. David was a mix of emotions. Uh, the man that had been chasing him and trying to kill him was dead. But so was his best friend. The loss of his best friend was something that he grieved greatly. But David also grieved the loss of Saul. He grieved the loss of his king. He grieved the loss of the one that God had appointed. Yeah, he was glad he was no longer going to be chased down um, and, and, and have attempts on his life. But he still mourned all the same. And now with Saul out of the way, David was clear to become king. And the first tribe to realize this was his own tribe. Uh, from page 156 of the story, it says, Then the men of Judah came to Hebron, and there they anointed king David, king over the tribe of Judah. When David was told that it was from the men of Jabesh, Gilead, who had buried Saul, he sent messengers to them and said, The Lord bless you for showing this kindness to Saul, your master, by burying him. So the men of Judah anointed David as king, claiming his as their king. But the problem was, um, the problem was there were more than just one tribe. There were 11 other tribes. Uh, and Saul had more sons than just Jonathan. In fact, there was one who believed he was the rightful heir to the kingdom. Sure, David was the one that, that Samuel had anointed. David was the one that God had chosen. But the family of Saul was not ready to give up uh, the kingdom that easily. They weren't just going to accept the fact that God gave the kingdom. So one of Saul's sons was going to fight with everything he had to make sure he got the crown. One of his, one of his sons' names was ish Bashef, which is a great name. Um, but he was made king over Israel by the commander of the army. And after a few battles and a few alliance changings and a few murders, um, this man was killed. And David was made the king of the whole nation. Page 156 says this, when all of the elders of Israel had come to King David at Hebron. The king made a covenant with them in Hebron before the Lord, and they anointed David king over Israel. David was 30 years old when he became king, and he reigned for 40 years. So now all is finally right in the world. Everything is right in the world now. David is king over the entire land. The entire, all 12 tribes see David as their king. They accept him as their king. He is a man of character and conviction. He loves God over everything else, and he's going to do everything in his power to make sure that Israel is a nation before God. David's deepest desire and vision for the people of Israel is for them to come back to God. For them to come back to a place where they are a people of God. Where they, where they are a chosen nation under God. Yes, David wanted Israel to be great. To be a great nation militarily, uh, economically, uh, infrastructure wise. But that was not his main objection or goal. It was not his sole aim. So in order for David uh, to fulfill uh, this, this main um, goal of having them to be a nation of God, he needs to bring the Ark of the Covenant to Jerusalem. You see, at this point of our story, Jerusalem is now being set up as the capital of, of Israel. Before that, uh, it was a place called Baalah. Uh, but, but now, David is going to reside in Jerusalem. Uh, his son Solomon is going to build a huge temple in Jerusalem for God. So the first thing that David needs to do is he needs to bring this Ark of the Covenant, this huge symbol of God coming down and, and being there in person. He needs to bring this to, his, to Jerusalem. 
This is hugely symbolic to the people. Bringing the ark uh, was so important because it puts the, puts the focus on God instead of on David. You see, this period in David's life, this is the prime of his life. He is the king. He is powerful. Everyone loves him. His approval rating is through the roof. And instead of bringing this glory and honor and praise unto himself, he's doing everything he can to push that onto God. So the people will focus on God and look at him instead of himself. David's promoting God instead of himself, encouraging the people to worship God instead of worshiping him. This is the account of the men bringing the ark from 2 Samuel 6, page 156. It says, David again brought together all of the able young men of Israel, 30,000. He and all his men went to Baalah in Judah to bring up there from the ark of God, which is called the name, the name of the Lord Almighty, who is enthroned between the cherubim on the ark. So the ark is moved to Jerusalem. This is now the center of worship, and worship is what they did. The text tells us that David danced with all of his might before the Lord, wearing nothing but a linen ephod. A linen ephod was just a sleeveless garment that went under the priestly garments. He's basically out there dancing in his underwear uh, in praise and worship to God. And all of the people, all of Israel, raises shouts of praise and worship and yells of worship and raised the trumpet blast. All in praise to God, all in worship to God, bringing glory and honor and praise and thanksgiving to the one that has sustained them throughout all of their history. The people of Israel were finally together. The people of Israel were finally there to bring praise to God. This is why God created them. This is why they were on the planet. This is why they were there. But not all were pleased with this worship. Um, after the parade and the praise session, David goes home and he's met with some serious resistance in 158. When David returned home to bless his household, Mikhail, the daughter of Saul, came out to meet him and said, How the king of Israel has distinguished himself today, going around half naked in full view of the slave girls of his servants, as any vulgar fellow would do. David said to Mikhail, it was before the Lord who chose me rather than your father or anyone from his house when he appointed me ruler over the Lord's people in Israel. I will celebrate before the Lord. I will become even more undignified than this, and I will be humiliated in my own eyes. But by these slave girls you spoke of, I will be held in honor. And Mikhail, daughter of Saul, had no children to the day of her death. So here's David's wife, the daughter of Saul. She is not happy with her husband. She is not happy with this display of worship that he has put on. She believed that his dancing around in an undergarment was vulgar and undignified. And she thought that this act was something that no king or any respectful human being or male should do. She didn't care if he was worshiping or not. He shouldn't act that way. And David's reply is awesome. He says, I will become even more undignified than that. He says, you think I was worshiping then, wait, I'll worship even harder next time, and you'll see when I dance before the Lord. Y'all know what this is, right? This is the first dispute over worship ever recorded. Yeah, in all of the disputes that people have in churches, worship is the one uh, that, that we have the most. Instruments versus acapella, hymns uh, versus modern praise forces, drums versus no drums, lights and fog or normal atmosphere. All of these disputes, yet here in the, in the book of 2 Samuel, here is the very first one. Here is the very first one. <laughs> this is a wife chastising a husband for dancing before the Lord. Dancing before the Lord. But here's the thing. David's worship, David's worship was pure in heart before God. He was dancing before God, giving him all of the praise and all of the glory and all of the honor. It wasn't the style of worship or the music or the hymn or the praise chorus or the drums or the, the fog or whatever. It was his heart. It was his attitude. It was his unwavering focus on God and all of his greatness. It was David's heart and desire and purpose to worship God and to give God everything he could give him through his worship. And that's what true worship looks like. It doesn't matter about a style. It doesn't matter about an instrument or anything. It's about the heart of the worshiper. That's why discussions on worship styles, worship styles sometimes can be so frustrating because once we get to that point, uh, we've completely missed it altogether. Our worship is us giving back to God in return for what he has given us and done for us. 
The realization that God gave his son for us, for our sins, to come to this earth, to die on the cross so that we could be redeemed should stop us in our tracks and make us bow down and worship before him. Our realization that God loves us more than anything in the universe should cause us to dance and shout and bring adoration before him and his greatness. We should stop and think about the greatness of God and our hearts should be overflowing with that praise, the praise that he deserves. So then all that we do, he receives the glory and the honor that he deserves. But it all starts within our hearts. In this month's uh, issue of Christianity Today uh, magazine, uh, there was an article on worship. And it was a great article about the posture of worship. But this is the paragraph that ended the article. It says, Scripture clearly demonstrates that the measure of true and acceptable corporate worship is not established by outside observers. Not by worshipers that attended or by the performers of the ritual, but it is established by God. The one that graciously invited us into his presence and who delights in being the object of our worship. Accordingly, true worship involves reverential acts of submission and homage before the divine ruler in response to his gracious revelation of himself and keeping with his revealed will. True worship starts inside our hearts before God. It cannot be seen from the outside. True worship cannot be seen from the outside. What we feel for God is a response to what he has done for us. That is why we worship. It's why David danced half naked in the streets and was found righteous for that. It's why we started in our service every single week uh, with songs of praise and worship. But it's our hearts that matter. Because if our hearts are not in to what we're doing, then it's completely meaningless. It's completely pointless. If we just come and go through the motions and just sing the four songs at the beginning and the one at the end, it's completely worthless if our heart is not in it. We might as well be doing Garth Brooks karaoke because it's going to be weighing them out the same. But if we put our hearts in our worship And we submit ourselves to the holy and one true God and give him thanks for everything that he has given to us and everything that he has done for us. Then our worship is true and it is good and it is accepted by him. So we're going to end this this, this, um, sermon time with a time of worship. We're going to lift lift high the name of God. So I beg you to just take a moment right now. And look into your heart. Look into your heart and give it to him now. Reflect on all of the greatness and awesomeness that is God. And everything that he has done for you. And worship him with everything that you have. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for everything that you have given to us. And we're so thankful uh, that we have the opportunity to open up this chapter of the story. And look at Saul and look at David. And God, forgive us for the times when we were like Saul, where we were jealous and we're, we're actively rooting against someone. Please get that out of our hearts. Get that out of our hearts so that we can be a people for you, so that we can love others with everything that we have. And God, we're also thankful for David and his uninhibited worship before you. God, please forgive us for the times when we come in this place and we just go through the motions and we just sing the words just because they're on the screen. Uh, or even less than that, just you know, stand there or look around or, or do anything else. God, forgive us for that. Let us come before you now with worship, giving you everything that we have. We love you and we are yours. And it's in your son's name we pray. Amen. <laughs>